G'day, this is Chris Savage from RL Ministries in Australia, welcoming you to this session of the Faith Foundations. I pray that it will be of benefit to you and help you in your Christian growth. Thank you for coming along. Okay, so this session of uh, Faith Foundations, we're looking at the deity of the Messiah. It's going to be a two-part series, and we'll do first part tonight. And what we're looking at here is, is the... Uh, if you remember when we did incarnation, incarnation does not mean that Jesus gave up any portion of his deity. It was not a lessening of deity. It was a, it was perfect day. His perfect deity, uh, Jesus. He what he did was he took hold of and he added to himself a human nature. Now, to merely prove his his pre existence does not by itself prove that he is God. It only proves that he existed before all creation, uh, be it you know angels, man, or or the material universe. That that's what pre-existence would that would tell us. So, what then is the evidence for the deity of the Messiah Jesus? Uh, in this study, what we're going to do is we're going to look at the deity of the Messiah and the evidences. We're going to look here. It's divided up into seven specific areas. And in the very last section, we will deal with Philippians 2, 5 to 11, which is called the kenosis, with Jesus emptying himself. We'll spend a little bit of time on that. Now, we see here in John chapter 1, verse 3, that all things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that has been made. Now, we see that uh, the first se section we're going to look at are the divine names of the Messiah. These names are names that can only belong to God. And we're going to see that Jesus is called these names. And so we see he's given certain names that either uh, imply deity or actually mean deity. And we have seven such names. Uh, we have God. We have the Son of God. We have Lord. We have the Alpha and Omega. The first and the last, the image, and then the very image. So what we're going to look at is each of these names. We just uh, spend a little bit of time on each of them. First up, we see God. In John, uh, this is the first of these divine names, and it's God. Well, that's, uh, that's obvious. <laughs> Jesus is actually called God in John chapter 1, verse 1. It says, John writing, he says, In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God, and the word was God. Now, this verse 1 here, it states that the word was with God. So it means he was with God, means he was distinct from God. And then John said that the word was God. This means that he is the same as God. And then in that chapter 1 of, of John's gospel, in verse 14, uh, John makes it very clear but the one he's speaking about in terms of the word is Jesus, because John says that this word, this Jesus, became flesh and dwelt among them. So how, how is it possible? You know, how is it possible? How this is possible comes only when one understands the Trinity. And uh, we've, we've done that previously. Remember that these are. Uh, these sessions that we're doing, we're building upon the previous session. So we did the Trinity some time ago, and, and now this is building upon the Trinity. So what we see here is that he was with God in that Jesus is not the Father, and Jesus is not the Holy Spirit, but he was God in that he is the Son, which is the second person of the Trinity or the Triunity. A second example of this divine name we see in John chapter 20, verse 28. And here we have, we have Thomas answered and said unto him, Thomas, one of his disciples, answered and said unto him, my Lord and my God. Remember, Thomas was the doubting disciple and he saw the resurrected Jesus and he addressed him as my Lord and my God. Now, Jesus did not try to correct him by saying, oh, no, no, no Thomas, you've made a mistake. Uh, no, Thomas, I, I'm your Lord, but I'm not your God. That's not what Jesus says. In actual fact, Jesus accepted the worship of Thomas. So what we see also is we see another 
example in Hebrews chapter 1 verse 8. Uh, and the writer of Hebrews says, but of the Son, he said, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. And the scepter of uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom. Now, in this, this, the writer of Hebrews is talking about Jesus here. And in this verse, Jesus is called God. So the writer of the book of Hebrews states here that the verse he, and he quoted here from the Old Testament, he quoted from Psalm 45, verse 6. Where in Psalm 45, verse 6, it says, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of equity is a scepter of thy kingdom. So this was specifically talking about the Son. So the Hebrew text uses the name Elohim, meaning God, and the New Testament clearly applies this, this, uh, these verses here in Hebrews and uh, to it applies it to the Psalm 45, verse 6, and it is speaking about God. So what the Hebrew writer is saying is that Jesus is God. Now, the second name we have is the Son of God. You know, we, we know that name, we're very familiar with that name, but this is a divine name. Uh, in English, it, you know, it, it, the term by itself doesn't really imply deity. You know, it's a Son of God, yeah. But, you know, into the ancient Jewish mind, it did. Because the name of the Son of God, was, it was very much a messianic title. That's a messianic title, the Son of God. And as a messianic title, it emphasized his deity. So Jesus is called the Son of God in, in quite a few places. Um, one example we find is in the context of Peter's confession in Matthew 16, verse 16, you know, uh, Jesus was quizzing his disciples about, you know, who they thought that he was. So he, he, asked, he asked them sitting down there, he says, listen, whom do men say that I am? Now, Peter responded for the rest of the disciples and he says, oh, he says, you are the Christ, the son of God. He's the son of God. But, the, you know, that's it. We read it in English, but the Greek is, is very emphatic. In fact, in the Greek, it reads, you are the son of the God, the living one. So this is a divine name used of Jesus Christ, the son of God. It's a divine name used of him. It's a messianic title. It's a messianic name. And therefore, it, it, it emphasizes his deity. The third name we have is the word Lord. And this also emphasizes his deity. In Greek, the term Lord, uh, Kyrios, is used of both men and God. But Jesus is referred to as Lord in the New Testament in the sense of God. And the reason this is true is because in those passages where the term Lord is used of Jesus, it is often a translation of Old Testament passages where God's personal name, Jehovah, is used. And two examples which we can find where Jesus is called Lord in the sense of deity, in the sense of the Jehovah of the Old Testament, are in Matthew chapter 22, verse 43 to 45, and also in Acts chapter 2, verses 34 to 35. Now, um, in Acts chapter 2, uh, sorry, uh, Matthew, Matthew and, 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 and Acts chapter 2 both quote Psalm 110, and that's speaking of Jehovah. Acts 2 quotes it as well as Matthew. Now, in Acts 2, 34 to 35, this is just straight out of Acts. It says, For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. So here it, it's a term referring to Jehovah. And the next term we have is the Alpha and Omega. And this is the fourth name that emphasizes. Messiah's deity. Uh, now, Alpha and Omega, uh, in, a, in, in the Greek alphabet, these are the first letters, Alpha and Omega is the last letter of the Greek alphabet. Now, if we look at Revelation chapter 1, verse 8, 
Jesus is called there the Alpha and the Omega, meaning that he is the beginning and he's the end of all things. Uh, and this is very similar to what John said in John chapter 1, verse 1, where John says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God. In other words, for as long as God has existed, the Word, the Messiah, has existed. So if the Messiah has existed forever in eternity past, that means he must be God. And that's the point of his fourth name, Alpha and Omega. He's the beginning and he is the end. As long as God was in existence, the Son was in existence. God existed in eternity past. The Son existed in eternity past. So for someone to have uh, ex eternally existed means that he is God. Has to be God. No one else. No one else could be that. Now we have another term very similar. And this is the fifth name that emphasizes his diet, Jesus' deity, we find in Revelation chapter 1, verse 17. And it is the term, the first and the last. Very similar to Alpha and Omega. You'd think, well, it's pretty much the same. Alpha and Omega actually emphasize the beginning and the end. But in this name, he is the first and he's the last. So he was always in existence and he will always be in existence. And again, this is also implying Jesus is deity. He is divine. He is God. Now we have the image, and this is, we find this, this is the sixth, sixth uh, name emphasizing the deity of, of, of Jesus, the Messiah. We find this in Colossians 1.15, where uh, Paul writes, who is speaking about, uh, about Jesus, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Now, the word image here means prototype, you know, it means the image in its revealed reality. So he is the image. It is the visible. So Jesus is the visible manifestation of the invisible, specifically the invisible God. Uh, Jesus says, if you've seen me, you've seen the father. So he is the exact image of the invisible God. He's the image in its revealed reality. He is the visible manifestation of the invisible God. As Jesus said, as anyone who has seen me has seen the Father, we find it in John 14, verse 9. So it, here it is an image that specifically emphasizes his divinity. Now, these are all great things uh, when the Jehovah Witnesses come knocking in your door. Now, we have the very image. Um, we find this, this is an, another name for Jesus. We find this in Hebrews 1, verse 3. Who being the effulgence of his glory and the very image of his substance and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had made purification of sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty and high. Now, this name is very similar to the, the, the previous name, but there's a one crucial difference here. In Colossians 1.15, he was called the image of the invisible God. But in this verse, a different Greek word is used, which means an exact image. So this is an image in the sense of, uh, you know, if you had a lump of clay and, and uh, you, you know, if you took some, if you took a coin or you took something and you, you pressed it into it, into the clay and took it off, what you'd have in the clay was an exact imprint of what was pressed into it so when jesus is called the very image it means that he is the exact impression of the divine nature exact impression and since the father is fully god the son is also fully god because everything that is true of the divinity of the father is also true of the divinity of the son why because he's an exact image no difference exact image now, so we've seen the divine names of the Messiah. We saw that there were seven of them. Now we're going to look at some of the divine attributes of Messiah. He has, altogether, he has 10. And each attribute would describe something that God is. And it is something that is also going to be characteristic of Jesus. So not something that he simply possesses. It's going to be something that it, it's part of his character. It, it's in him. 
So this will also mean that he is also God. Now, the first one we look at, the first attribute is that of eternality. Eternality does not simply mean that he will exist eternally into the future. Uh, and that's something that is also true of angels and saints. We're going to exist into the future. Eternality also means for Jesus that he eternally existed in the past. And concerning the Messiah, one of those, one of those prophets, Micah, in Micah chapter 5, verse 2, he states, whose goings forth are from old, from everlasting. Now, Micah, you, that, that word everlasting, Micah uses that. That's the strongest possible Hebrew word for eternity past to emphasize the eternality of the Messiah. And John 1.1 1, 1 states, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. So the point of John 1.1 1, 1 is that for as long as God has been in existence, the Messiah has been in existence. And because God has existed forever, then the Son has existed forever as well. And other passages that teach the eternality of the Son, we see in John uh, chapter 8, verse 58. Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. I am that I am. Also, we see in um, Colossians 1, 17, and also in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1, both of those passages also speak about Jesus's eternal nature. Now, the second thing about it, the second attribute is emphasizing his deity is his immutability. We use that word every day, don't we? Immutability. What does that mean? It means he never gets old. The fact that he's immutable means that he is changeless. He stays the same in his divine nature without any decrease in his divine power. The immutability of the Messiah is taught in two passages, both of them in the book of Hebrews, which if you're interested, we're starting tomorrow, tomorrow morning, 10 o'clock. First passage is Hebrews chapter 1, verses 10 to 12. And you, Lord, in the beginning did lay the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of your hands. They shall perish, but you continue, and they shall all wax old as does a garment, and as a mantle shall you roll them up as a garment, and they shall be changed. But you are the same, and your years shall not fail. And the second passage we see in Hebrews, again, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today, yes, and forever. Contextually, this refers to his divine nature. Jesus has the attribute of immutability. He does not change. A third attribute that emphasizes his deity is self-existence. His existence does not depend upon any other subject. Nobody else. Our existence is dependent upon the work of preservation, which God does. The reason you and I get up every morning is because God has preserved this. But the Son, Jesus the Son, he is self-existent according to John chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that has been made. So these verses emphasize his self-existence in that he was not created. Jesus always existed. Through him, everything that was created is now in existence. And a second passage that emphasizes his self-existence is found in John chapter 5, verse 26. For as the Father has life in himself, even so he gave to, even so gave he to the Son also to have life in himself. So the fact that the Son has life in himself shows that the Son is self-existent. A fourth attribute that emphasizes deity is the attribute of life. 
And John 1, 4 states that in him was life and the life was the light of men. Now, this was not a life that was created, all right? It was not a life that was generated through natural means. He actually has life within himself. And, and again, this emphasizes his deity. And the same point we see in, in John chapter 14, verse 6, where he says that I am the way, the truth, and the life. And again, uh, in Acts chapter 3, verse 15, where, where um, Luke writes and he says, you kill the author of life. Jesus Christ is life. The fifth divine attribute we see here is found in Colossians 2, 9, and it has to do with the fullness of the Godhead. In Colossians 2, verse 9, for in him that's in Christ dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Now, this attribute emphasizes that everything that is obligatory to deity, everything that proves the deity of the Father and the deity of the Spirit is also true of the Son. Therefore, the Son is also deity. He is God. So everything that is true of the divine nature of the Father and the Spirit is therefore also true of the divine nature of the Son, Jesus. And we see uh, the, the, uh, this one here, the sixth attribute uh, has to do with his attribute of holiness. And we see this in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 26. He says, for such a high priest became us, holy, guileless, undefiled, separated from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. So this verse clearly teaches us that Jesus has holiness within himself. Now, the holiness that, that you and I as saints have, it's our holiness is applied holiness. It is a holiness that comes from Jesus the Messiah. It is a holiness that is reckoned when we are reckoned righteousness. It's a holiness that is counted to us when we are reckoned righteous. Now, Jesus does not have a righteousness that was applied to him or that was reckoned to him because his holiness is a holiness that is true within himself. Therefore, he has the attribute of holiness. You know, the seventh attribute uh, of Messiah is one of sovereignty. He's in total control. For example, in Matthew chapter 5, verses 27 to 28, he has the authority to execute judgment. It, the fact that Jesus has the authority to do the work of divine judgment proves that he is sovereign. Uh, and we see this also in Matthew 28, verse 18, where it says here, and Jesus came to them and spake and spoke unto them, saying, All authority has been given unto me in heaven and on earth. All authority means exactly that. All authority in heaven and on earth. So Jesus stated that his authority is not only on the earth, but in heaven also. And this is also taught by John, again in John 17 too, where uh, John writing, he says, even as you gave him authority over all flesh, that to all whom you have given him, he should give eternal life. First Peter 3, 22. Peter is writing here, he says, speaking of Jesus, who is on the right hand of God, having gone into heaven, angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto him. So Jesus is the one sovereign over all, over everything. A created being such as an angel or a man could never give eternal life to somebody else. And we see here, in, in John 17, 2, he gives eternal life. Now, the sovereignty of the Son is also taught in Acts chapter 2, verse 36, and, and also Philippians 2, 9 to 10. That's the kenosis area. Colossians 1, 18, and Revelation 19, 16. Now, what about his omnipotence? Omnip Again, these are words we use every, every day, don't we? So this is his eighth attribute 
omnipotence. What does it mean? It means that Jesus is all powerful. He's all powerful. And now to be all powerful means that he must be God because he is all powerful. Nobody else has more power than he does. He's all powerful. And the fact that he's omnipotent, all powerful, is taught in John chapter 10, verse 18. And Jesus is speaking here. He says, no one takes it away from me. This is about his life. No one takes my life away from me. Uh, but I lay it down of myself. And I have power to lay it down. And I have power to take it up again. And this commandment received I from my father. So the fact here that Jesus has power over his own life, both to take it and to raise it, shows omnipotence of a very unique degree. Now, you know, all men have authority to take their own life. When I say all have, have authority, it means that they can take their own lives. They're not authorized to take it, but they can take it. But nobody has the authority to raise themselves back to life again. That is simply only for Jesus. So the omnipotence, or only for God. The omnipotence of the Son is also taught in a couple other sections. Uh, Luke 8, 25, 1 Corinthians 15, 25 and 28, uh, Philippians 3, 21, Colossians 1, 16 to 17, Hebrews 1, 3, Jude 20, Revelation 1, 18. It's, it's, uh, it, it, it's, it's spread throughout the, the epistles. In Colossians 1, 16, it says, For by him, by Jesus, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. So he is omnipotent. In Hebrews 1.13, he upholds the universe by the word of his power. The reason all those stars stay in their places, all their planets stay in their places, all the galaxy stays in places, is because Jesus is upholding it by the word of his power. That's why they're there. Omniscience. This is the ninth attribute of the Messiah. Omniscience means that he is all-knowing. He knows all there is to know. He knows everything in reality, and he knows every possibility. He knows simply everything. The fact that Jesus is omnipotent, uh, omniscient, sorry, is taught by Matthew eleven twenty-seven, um, John one forty-eight. 225 john covers it quite a bit first corinthians 4 5 colossians 2 3 and revelation 2 23 now in what we see in matthew 11 verse 27 it, uh, here we see we see here uh, jesus saying that all things have been handed over to me by my father and no one knows the son except the father and no one knows the father except the son remember he is all knowing and in Revelation 2, verse 23. And all the churches will know that I am he who searches mind and heart, and I'll give to each of you according to your works. So Jesus knows what everyone is thinking, knows what every intention of every human being is for all time. He is omniscient. He is all-knowing. Now we have his omnipresence, and this is the 10th attribute of of deity omnipresence what does that mean it means that he is everywhere at the same time how can that be except you're god and that's exactly right to be everywhere at the same time could only be true of god and the fact that jesus is omnipresent is taught in matthew 18 20 28 20 and we see it here in uh, in john 14 23 there's a couple of other passages as well um, John 14, 18, 20 as well. In John 14, 23, what Jesus says here is that if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. To come to every believer and make their home in every believer means that he is omnipresent. He is everywhere at the same time. He is with you in Sydney, with me here, with you in Adelaide and Brisbane and in Western Australia. Now, the third area that we're looking at, the third evidence of Jesus' deity is that he does the work of God. In other words, uh, Jesus is doing works that only God can do. 
if Jesus is doing works that only God can do, this again is evidence of his deity. And we're going to look at six works of God. Uh, first up, we're going to look at creation. And now creation is a work that only God can do. Uh, but, but in John chapter 1, verse 3, what did John say? John says that Jesus performed the work of creation. Because John says, all things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that has been made. And it's also repeated in John 1, verse 10. He was in the world, and the world was made through him. Everything was made through him, and the world knew him not. So here we see uh, John's writing that he made everything. He created everything. In 1 Corinthians 8, verse 6, Paul actually reaffirmed what John had taught. Uh, uh, Paul writing to the Corinthians, he says, Yet to us there is one God, the Father of whom are all things, and we unto him. And one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things, and we through him. And again, he repeats the same truth to the Colossian church in Colossians 1, 6, the church of Colossae. For in him were all things created, in the heavens and upon the earth, things invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things have been created through him and onto him. And the same truth we see in, in the, the author, the writer in the book of Hebrews, in Hebrews 1, 3 and Hebrews 1, 10. So from these passages, it is clear that Jesus, the son, does the work of creation which means that he is God. What about in, pres in preservation? Uh, preserving uh, preservation, uh, preserving that which has been created is another work only God can perform. And this is the second work that the Son does that is a work of God. It's preservation. And this is taught in two New Testament passages. First passage we see in Colossians 1.17. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. Now, all th in him all things consist, or all things are held together. This verse teaches that the Messiah is the one who is actually holding the universe and preserving it. He is that uh, atomic glue that scientists talk about, that they can't explain why these, these, these things then sp spin out into, into the nether nether. Um, the, the scientists talk about this mysterious thing that holds this mysterious glue that holds the atoms together to keep them from exploding in all directions. And they can't explain it. Well, the Bible tells us that it is Jesus who is holding all things together. He's preserving all things. And the second passage we see is in Hebrews 1, 3, who being the effulgence of his glory and the very image of his substance, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had made purification of sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty and high. So not only is the creation of the universe uh, or everything a work of God, but the preservation of creation is a work of God. And Jesus does the work of preservation, which means he must be God. This area of forgiveness of sins, this is the third work that, that the that Messiah does that is a work that only God can do. Only God can forgive sins in a salvation sense. Only God can do that. Yet Jesus has the authority to, to forgive sins, a fact which emphasizes again his deity. He's seeing forgiving sins in, in Matthew 9, verse 2 and verse 6, in Luke 5, 24, in Luke 7, 47 to 48. Now, in Matthew 9, verse 6, but that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he then said to the paralytic, rise, pick up your bed and go home. So the paralytic was not only healed, but his sins were forgiven by the one who healed him. And in Luke chapter 7, verse 47 to 48, therefore I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But he who is forgiven little loves little. And he said to her, your sins are forgiven. So who alone can forgive sins in a salvation sense? It is Jesus. 
it is God. And therefore, if Jesus is doing it, Jesus is God. What about the sending of the Holy Spirit? Only God can send forth the Holy Spirit. Yet this is a work which, according to John 15, 26, Messiah does. But when, but this is uh, John writing, he says, but when the, the, when the Comforter comes, this is Jesus speaking, he says, but when the Comforter come, when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceeds from the Father, he shall bear witness of me. Now, for someone to be able to send the Holy Spirit, he must be either an equal of or greater than the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is God. And for Jesus to be able to send him means that he must also be God. Resurrection. According to the New Testament, the Messiah will be responsible for raising people from the dead. Again, this is also a work only God can do. And this is the fifth work that Messiah will do. In John chapter 6, verse 40, we read that he'll be responsible for raising both the righteous and the unrighteous from the dead. For this is the will of my, this is John 6, verse 40. For this is the will of my father, that everyone that beholds the son and believes on him should have eternal life. And I will raise him up at the last day. This is the final resurrection. Since the resurrection of the dead is a work of God, it means that Jesus himself must be God. In the final judgment, this is the sixth work uh, of God that, is, that Messiah will do and that he will execute the final judgment. Now, throughout the Old Testament, uh, it, it's, it's, pretty, it's clearly taught there that someday God will render final judgment. The prophets teach about this. Now, the work that was ascribed to God the Father in the Old Testament is ascribed to the Son in the New Testament. So obviously, if the Old Testament says that God is responsible for final judgment, and then the New Testament says that Jesus is responsible for final judgment, then Jesus must be God. One passage that teaches that Jesus will be responsible for final judgment is Matthew 25, 31 to 46. We won't read that because it's a bit long. And that deals with the judgment of the Gentiles, the sheep and goat Gentiles. And it is a son, Jesus, who is doing the judging. And in John chapter 5, verse 22 to 27, it says that the son has been given the right to judge the righteous and the unrighteous. Now in Acts 17, 31, which we have here, it says that he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this, he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. God is going to give this man whom he has raised from the dead to judge. So Paul announced that someday God will judge all men through the son whom he raised from the dead. This is also taught to us by Acts chapter 10, verse 42. It says there to testify that he is the one appointed by God to be judge of the living and the dead. And then 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10, it says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. And again, you see in, in, uh, in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, similar, similar, similar things. Okay, now, here we see worship being ascribed to the Messiah. This is another evidence of Jesus' deity because we're going to see that worship is accorded to him. He's worshipped in a way only God can be worshipped. And also, when he was worshipped, he received it and welcomed it showing that he claimed to be God and he accepted worship as God. And some examples of this we see is Matthew 14, verse 33, uh, John 9, 38, and John 20, verse 28. Yeah, Matthew 14, verse 33, uh, you know, the, 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 these guys from the boat, the storm has now been uh, um, subsided by the word from Jesus. It says, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, truly, you are the son of God. Now, in John chapter 20, verse 28, 
Thomas. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Now, Thomas, the doubting disciple, he's finally convinced concerning the resurrection. He's seen Jesus. He's touched Jesus. He not only believed that Jesus was a man resurrected from the dead, he also believed he was his Lord and his God. Now, in that context, when, when, when uh, Thomas said this to Jesus, Jesus didn't correct Thomas by saying, whoa, whoa, hang on, don't call me God, you know, or don't worship me. No, quite the opposite. He accepted Thomas's worship. Why? Because he is God. And then we see also that Jesus is worshipped as God in Philippians 2 verse 10 and Hebrews 1 verse 6, which reads... And when he again brings in the firstborn into the world, he says, let all the angels of God worship him. So not only is Jesus worshipped by other men such as Thomas, he is also worshipped by the angels. Now, to be worshipped by the angels clearly implies deity. Philippians 2.10, at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and on the earth. So all men will bow down before Jesus and worship him. Now we see it, that uh, another attribute of God or another work of God is the giving of immortality. And this is the fifth evidence of the deity of the Messiah in that he gives immortality or eternal life. Uh, and the fact that the son Jesus is able to give eternal life clearly shows us his deity. He has the divine capacity to give immortality. And we see this in four passages. First passage is John 5, verses 28 to 29. Marvel not at this, for the hour comes in which all that are in the tombs shall hear his voice and shall come forth, and they that have done good unto the resurrection of life, they that have done evil unto the resurrection of judgment. Second passage John 6, 39 to 40. And this is the will of him that sent me, that of all, all that which he has given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up at the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone that beholds the Son and believes on him should have eternal life, immortality, and I will raise him up at the last day. Third passage, John 17, verse 2. Even as you gave him authority over all flesh, that to all whom you have given him, he should give eternal life. And the fourth passage is Philippians 3, verse 21. Who shall fashion anew the body of our humiliation, that it may be conformed to the body of his glory, according to the working whereby he is able even to subject all things unto himself. That as far as we'll go this week and next time we meet, we will finish it off. Contact details there. If you need to contact us, thank you.